Hey guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Before I begin, I want to say Happy Veterans Day to everyone. Um, if you're watching and you're currently serving active duty or you served in the armed forces and the military, thank you for your service. Thank you so, so much. Guys, a couple things I have to talk to you about. I got to get some house cleaning. I got to talk to you about some things before we get started on this video. By the way, the video I'm going to do today, what am I talking to you about today? I don't even remember. Yes, I'm going to be talking to you guys about insulins and oral hypoglycemic drugs, okay? So we're doing pharmacology. Before we start, though, I have to talk to you guys about something because things are going to change a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go back. A few days ago, a friend invited me to an all-night um, prayer session that they were having at her church and I went and visited. I didn't stay all night. Um, I will pray and I'm not there yet, but I'll pray. And I felt like I prayed for two hours. And then when I'm done praying, I look and I only prayed for like 10 minutes. So I couldn't do all night, but I went. And one of the things that I asked God, I said to God, I was, I was praying and I said, you know, this gift that you gave me, this talent that you've given me that I can teach people about nursing and it translates in a way that they understand, they grasp the material. I, I see, I'm see, i seeing it. I get it all the time. I don't believe that you gave me this gift just for me to keep for myself. And when I say for me to keep for myself, yes, I teach you guys, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm teaching you guys and you know, I made a business out of it. I profit off of it. I make audio lessons for purchase. I do all type of things. And even what I do for free, such as my videos, that I do across all of my social media platforms. I do it for free, but none of that is expanding God's kingdom. And so I said to God, I know you did not give me these talents just for myself. What is it that I can do to help expand your kingdom? And less than 48 hours later, I was driving and I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, you need to start praying for your students. Those students that are watching you that need that help, you need to start praying for them. So I'm telling you right now, guys, moving forward, every single video that I do that I'm teaching, I'm going to start off by praying for every viewer. Now, I'm not forcing you. If you're not into that, you don't believe in God, you don't want prayer, that's fine. You can stop watching or you can just fast forward. However, if you are one of those people that do believe in prayer, maybe you don't, but at this point, you're at the end of your rope and you're willing to try anything, just go ahead, close your eyes. I'm going to do a quick prayer before we begin. All right, let's go. Father God, thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for watching over us and protecting us, Father God. Lord, I ask um, for forgiveness of my sins and the sins of anyone that's watching right now, Jesus. Father God, I pray for every single viewer that is watching. Lord, I ask that you please help them. That next exam that they have coming up, Father God, I ask that you help them on the exam, Father God. As they're studying, Lord, I ask that you open up their intelligence, give them wisdom, Jesus Christ, so that they can understand the material that's being presented to them, Father God, and so that they can be able to regurgitate that those same um, concepts and content on that next exam. Father God, I pray for every single person that is watching right now, Jesus. The next time they're about to take a test and they're about to choose the wrong answer, Father God, I pray that you put them in a chokehold until they choose the right answer. Lord, I ask that you help them. And Father God, any stresses that are coming against them for them not to study the way that they should study, Father God, I call it down right now in the name of Jesus. Because if they're watching, Father God, they believe. And I ask that you please help them, help them do better, help them to pass, Father God, and help them to pass it forward. I praise your name and I give you all the glory in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. As I said, I'm going to be covering the oral hypoglycemic agents and the different types of insulin. Now, uh, one more thing. If you haven't done so already, guys, don't forget to do what? Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, guys, don't forget I'm on the other so other social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. On my website, Nexus Nursing Institute, I have audio lessons available. If you're one of those students that just need that extra push, you love the questions that I give you, but you know what? You need that extra push as far as the lecture is con concerned. You need that help to focus on what is most important in that textbook what you're most likely going to see on your next exam, go check out my website, check out the audio lessons that I have available for you. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. First question. 
The nurse administered 25 units of Humulin N to a client with type 1 diabetes at 1600. Which intervention should the nurse implement? One, assess the client for hypoglycemia around 1800. Two, ensure the client eats a nighttime snack. Three, check the client's serum blood glucose level. Or four, serve the client the support. I can't speak. Serve the client the supper tray. And guys, the correct answer is two. Ensure the client eats a nighttime snack. Why? All right, let's look at this, guys. If you go back to the question, look at the type of insulin we're giving, Humulin N. You have to know your insulins, guys. You have to know which insulin falls under which class. I don't know what's wrong with my studio. The studio is the only place in my home that I get a runny nose whenever I come in. But anyway, Humulin N, what kind of insulin is that, guys? That's an intermediate acting insulin, okay? So it says that we're giving Humulin N, which is an intermediate acting insulin to a patient that's type one at 1600 hours. There's a reason they gave you that time, guys. 1600 hours is four o'clock. We're giving an intermediate acting insulin at four o'clock. Which intervention should the nurse um, implement? The reason number two is the correct answer, guys, we have to remember um, with this humulin insulin, when is the peak time? The peak time, guys, is going to be about six to eight hours after administration. Remember, the peak time of insulin, the peak of insulin is when the blood sugar is going to be the lowest. That is the most dangerous time for a diabetic patient. So when you get a test question about giving the patient an insulin and they ask you something about when would you um, assess them more closely? When would you monitor them more closely? W when would you be most concerned? What they're really asking you is what is the peak time of insulin? Because the peak of the insulin is the most dangerous time for that patient. That's when we have to check them the closest because that's um, the time when they're at highest risk for bottoming out. Now, I want you to think about this, guys hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia? Which one's more dangerous? Hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia will kill a patient much faster than hyperglycemia. So here we are, we gave the patient an intermediate acting insulin at 4 p.m. at 1600, right? We know that the peak time is around six to eight hours. So within six to eight hours, we are concerned about that patient, what? Bottoming out because their blood sugar is too low. So what are we going to do? Give them a nighttime snack. So that around that time, we expect the peak of the insulin, which means the blood sugar is going to be the lowest. We're going to give them a snack so they don't bottom out. That's why number two is the correct answer. Now let's look at our other choices. One, assess the client for hypoglycemia around 1800. In the question, it says that we gave the insulin at 1600. If we were to assess them at 1800, which means two hours later, that means we'd be concerned about the peak being two hours later. What's the peak of insulin that's two hours, would be two hours later? That's regular insulin, guys. Regular insulin has a peak of two hours after administration. So it's when you give regular insulin, about two hours after you gave that regular insulin, that's when you'd be assessing them more closely. That's when you might have to give them a snack because you're scared that their blood sugar will, you know, bottom out, right? But we're talking about intermediate, so that can't be the answer. Choice three, check the serum's blood glucose level. Didn't you check that patient's glucose level before you gave the insulin? Why would you be checking it after? Come on. So you know that's not the answer. We're going to check that patient's blood glucose before. We're going to do a glucose check before we give the insulin. Because guess what? If that patient's glucose is too low, are we still going to give the insulin? No. We're going to withhold that insulin and call the doctor and let them know we withheld it because the patient's blood sugar was XYZ, right? Choice four, check, uh, excuse me, serve the client the supper tray. Let me tell you about this. Serving the client the supper tray. Whenever you guys get a question about, you know, um, when would you feed the client? When would you make sure the client ate? When would you give them the breakfast tray, the lunch tray, whatever? What they're really asking you is when is the onset of this insulin? Think about it. The onset is when the insulin starts to work. So if um, I'm giving a patient the insulin, and the onset 
is five to 10 minutes. So for example, I'm giving a rapid, the onset is five to 10 minutes. Hello? So I need to make sure that that food is right there in front of the patient and the patient what? Is eating. Because I know that in five to 10 minutes, it's gonna start working and I don't want that patient to bottom out on me, okay? So whenever you get an um, insulin question and they're asking about food, 99% of the time, what they're really asking you about is the onset of that insulin versus when they ask you, when would you assess them um, more closely? What they're really asking you about is the peak of the insulin versus when they ask you, when would you expect to give them next administration of that insulin? What they're really asking you is what the duration of that insulin is because at the end of the duration, that's when they would have to have another dose. So you would have to know how long that insulin lasts for. Okay, guys, this is very important. And I'm telling you, NCLEX is going to kill you with insulins. Why? So many people in the United States of America are diabetic. So it doesn't matter what state you're testing for. If you're testing for the NCLEX, LPN or RN, you have to know your insulins and your oral hypoglycemics like the bottom of, like, how do they say? The bottom of your hand or the back of your hand? I think they say the back of your hand, but I might be wrong. Put in the comments, guys, if I'm wrong. But you need to know it very well, okay? Let's go to number two. The nurse is teaching the client with type 1 diabetes how to use an insulin pen injector. Which information should the nurse discuss with the client? One, instruct the client to dial in the number of the insulin unit needed to inject. Two, demonstrate the proper way to draw up the insulin in an insulin syringe. Three, discuss that the insulin pen injector must be used in the abdominal area only. Or four, explain that the traditional insulin syringe is less painful than the injector pain. Injector pen. And guys, the correct answer is one, instruct the client to dial in the number of insulin of insulin u units needed to inject. So guys, that insulin pen, it kind of looks like a fountain pen. And so what they do, they have to turn the dial to the amount they need it. So if they need two, they should turn the dial and they'll hear and they'll feel two clicks, click, click. If they need four, they'll go click, 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 click right? And this is very helpful to those patients whose vision is not good. You know, they don't see the elderly patients who just don't see well enough and they cannot draw up the com correct amount of insulin. Depends. All they have to do is listen and feel the clicks and they can count how many units, okay? That is the correct answer when we're talking about the insulin pen injectors. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices too. Demonstrate the proper way to drop insulin in an insulin syringe. Well, guys, I just told you with the insulin pen injector, you don't draw anything up. This is already pre-filled. It comes in a pre-filled cartridge. It's already in the pen. And all you got to do is turn the dial to the amount of units that you need. Three, discuss that the insulin pen injector must be used in the abdominal area only. What did I tell you guys about all inclusive, like an only, always, never, right? I told you, do not choose them unless you know that you know that you know that you know. That's the answer. And this ain't the answer, okay? Not only, this patient can, they can administer that in um, that insulin subcuta subcutaneously anywhere else they would administer subcutaneously. So yes, they can use the sub-Q fat in the abdomen. They can also use the sub-Q fat here in the arms, right? Those fatty places um, that you administer insulin, they can use. They're just using injector pen and um, not your traditional needle. Um, syringe. Choice four, explain that the traditional in insulin syringe is less painful than the injector pen. Actually, it's the opposite. Um, we find that the injector pen, patients um, complain that it's more painful than the traditional um, syringe. I don't know why. Maybe the pen, the needle on the pen, pen is more thick. I couldn't tell you. I have no clue. However, we do know that patients tend to state, I don't like to say complain, but they tend to state that the pen is more painful than the traditional needle. So guys, number one is the correct answer. The nurse is teaching a client newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes insulin therapy. Which statement indicates that the client needs more teaching concerning insulin therapy? One, I have a headache. I have a headache or 
If I have a headache or start getting nervous, I'll drink some orange juice. Two, if I pass out at home, a family member should give me a glucagon injection. Three, because I'm taking my insulin daily, I don't have to adhere to a diabetic diet. Or four, I'll check my glucose with my glucometer at least once a day. And guys, the correct answer is three, because I'm taking my insulin daily, I do not have to adhere to a diabetic diet. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Let me tell you something. Insulin and oral hypoglycemics, these are used as adjuncts, right, to proper diet and exercise. So the patient has to follow their diet, their diabetic diet. They have to exercise. They can't be a couch potato. They got to be moving around and they also have to take their meds. These medications do not replace diet and exercise. So guys, with this question where they're asking you, um, <coughs> excuse me, let me find the question. Which statement um, needs more teaching? What they're really asking you is which one is the wrong answer. And that's the wrong answer when the patient says that they don't have to adhere to their diabetic diet anymore. They absolutely do. All of the other choices are absolutely correct. Matter of fact, let's talk about them. Choice one, if I have a headache or get nervous, I'll drink some orange juice. Absolutely. What does that tell us? If a patient is a known diabetic, they start getting confused. They start getting jittery. They start getting nervous. Cool and clammy, need some candy, right? Those are signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. We're going to give them orange juice. Do not waste time going to check that patient's blood sugar. If they are a known diabetic and they are exhibiting those signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, give them orange juice. What happens if you waste time to go find a glucometer, that patient may bottom out on you. Because remember what I said, guys, which will kill a patient faster, hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia? Hypoglycemia every single day of the week, okay? If they are known diabetic and they are exhibiting the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, you're going to give them orange juice, okay? Orange juice is a fast-acting carb. You know, it's going to bring up their blood sugar uh, immediately. Then you can follow it up with, you know, some type of um, complex carb and protein. But, you know, for the answer choices that you're going to see, it's going to be orange juice. All right, let's talk about our other choices. Uh, two, if I pass that out, if I pass out at home, a family member should give me a glucagon injection. Absolutely. If the patient is a known diabetic, they pass out. What are you suspecting? Hypoglycemia. But they passed out. Can you put anything in their mouth? No, they might aspirate. So you teach those family members to inject that glucagon, which will make um, the glucose be immediately available. Remember, guys, glucagon is the the stored form of glucose. So that's wonderful. That's true. That's why we're not picking that as the answer. Choice four, I'll check my blood glucose with my glucometer at least once a day. Absolutely. You're diabetic, type one especially, you absolutely need to be checking your blood glucose to make sure that whichever dosage of insulin you're taking has been effective. And in the question, in the answer, it says at least once a day. So the minimum is once a day. So all of those were good answer choices and we were looking for the wrong answer. That is why we chose um, number three. The nurse administered 12 units of regular insulin to the patient with type one diabetes at 0700 hours. Which meal would prevent the client from experiencing hypoglycemia? One, breakfast, two, lunch, three, supper, or four, nighttime snack. And guys, the correct answer is one, breakfast. Here's why. Go back to the question. And then question, what type of insulin are we giving? Regular, right? Remember I told you when you get a question about insulin and they're asking you, let me go back to the question, um, about when you'd access them further or when you'd be concerned about hypoglycemia, what they're really asking you is about the peak time. And what's the peak time of regular insulin? Two to four hours. So if we gave the insulin at seven o'clock in the morning, Around nine o'clock, we'd be concerned that that patient may start having hypoglycemic reactions. So, you know, what is a patient eating around 9, 10 a.m.? Breakfast. And that's why number one is the correct answer. The client diagnosed with type 1 diabetes complaining of dry mouth, extreme thirst, and increased urination. Which action should the nurse implement? One, administer one amp of IV 50% glucose. Two, administer the 
excuse me, prepare to administer the IV regular insulin. Three, inject humulin and subcutaneously into the abdomen. Or four, hang an IV infusion of D5W at a keep open rate. And guys, the correct answer is two. Prepare to administer IV regular insulin. So look at the so signs and symptoms, guys. They tell you that this is a diabetic. It's a type one, so this is a known diabetic. Dry mouth, extreme thirst, increased urination. What are we suspecting here, guys? We're suspecting hyperglycemia, okay? Um, polyuria, that's that excessive urination. Polyphagia, that's that excessive thirst. Poly, I have three polys, urinate, polyuria, poly, polydipsia. Polydipsia is excessive thirst. Polyphagia is excessive um, hunger. And polyuria is excessive urine. Sorry about, sorry about that, guys. But those three polys, excessive thirst, excessive urination, excessive hunger, those are classic signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia, right? Um, hot and dry, sugar is too high. This is what we're seeing here. That patient's blood sugar is too high. So they need insulin. That's why number two is the correct answer. Prepare to administer IV regular insulin. We're getting that insulin into the patient right away so that blood sugar can drop immediately. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, administer one amp IV 50% glucose. Oh, you just turned into a killer. Yeah. You just killed your patient. Your patient's having a hyperglycemic reaction, a severe hyperglycemic reaction, and your solution is to give them more glucose? Absolutely not. Guys, you have to know the signs and symptoms of hyper versus hypoglycemia. Choice three, inject humulin and subcutaneously into the abdomen. Well, we talked about this already, guys. Humulin N is what? An intermediate acting insulin. Its onset isn't until two to four hours. This patient is having a severe hyperglycemic reaction. Why would you give them an insulin that doesn't even start working until two to four hours after administration? Does that make sense? No, you wanna give them something that's gonna start working immediately, right? And um, number four, hang an IV infusion of D5W. Again, you just killed your patient. The patient's already having a hyperglycemic reaction. We need to give them insulin to bring that blood sugar down, not give them more glucose. So guys, number two is a correct answer. The client newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes asked the nurse, why should I get an external portable insulin pump? Which statement is the nurse's best response? One, it'll cause you to have fewer hypoglycemic reactions and, will, and it will control blood glucose levels better. Two, insulin pumps provide an automatic memory of the date and time of the last boluses. Three, the pump injects intermediate acting insulin automatically into the vein to maintain a normal blood glucose level. Or four, the portable pump is the easiest way to administer insulin to someone with type 1 diabetes and is highly recommended. And guys, the correct answer is one. It will cause you to have fewer hypoglycemic reactions and it will control blood glucose levels better. So guys, um, this external pump, it gives you both your basal and your bolus, but it doesn't give you intermediate. It only gives you um, regular or rapid, okay? So this is ac this is absolutely true. It gives you fewer hypoglycemic reactions because what happens is um, when that patient eats, it shoots out a bolus. Okay, you know how when you eat, your blood sugar goes out, up. Well, when this patient eats, it shoots out a bolus, so that way it helps control that it, control and regulate the blood sugar. So that is a correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices too. Insulin pumps provide automatic memory of the date and time of the last twenty four bolus. 24 boluses. That's true. That's true, but it doesn't answer our question. Okay, the question is, why should I get it? And the reason we're going to teach the patient to get it is because it helps regulate the blood sugar. It helps keep that blood sugar at a lower level. Choice three, the pump injects intermediate acting automatically into the vein to maintain a normal. No, it doesn't. It, um, um, Rapid. It delivers rapid. I'm sorry. I think before I said rapid and um, regular, but I 
think it's only rapid. I have to double check on that. Or someone put in the comments for me for the pump. Does it also give regular? I know for sure rapid, but anyway, it delivers a rapid into the um, subcutaneous um, area, not the vein. So number one is wrong because it said intermediate. And number two is wrong because it said um, vein and not subcutaneous. So that is wrong. I'm almost sure it's only rapid I, for the life of me, but I'm almost sure it only gives rapid in the pump. Someone look it up for me, please. Put in the comment below. Um, choice four, the portable pump is the easiest way to administer insulin to someone with type 1 diabetes and highly recommended. No, it's not. No, it's not. Matter of fact, when a patient is just diagnosed with diabetes, what is a traditional form? We have them draw up the insulin syringes and we teach them how to do that because this pump you have to um really have a working knowledge of blood sugar levels and keeping them in control and the pump excuse me um and so it's not highly recommended especially not people who are newly diabetic now if the person's been diabetic for a very long time Oh, sorry, guys. I got to remove this off my camera. Okay. They've been diabetic for, you know, some time and um, they really know what they're doing. We'll offer this as a choice, but never off the bat. It is, it's just not for somebody who's a newly um, diagnosed as diabetic. It, the pump is really for somebody who knows what they're doing. So that's wrong. And number one's the correct answer. The nurse in the medical department is preparing to administer Humalog, a rapid-acting insulin, to a client diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Which intervention should the nurse implement? One, ensure the client's wearing a medical alert bracelet. Two, administer the dose according to regular insulin sliding scale. Three, assess the client for hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non I can't speak, non-ketotic coma. Or four, make sure the client eats the food on a meal tray that is at the bedside. And guys, the correct answer is four. Make sure the client eats the food on the meal tray that is at the bedside. You're showing that you can see the food right there. And not only do you see the food right there, you make sure the client ate it. You don't give... Matter of fact, before I even say what I was going to say, let's go back to the question. They're getting rapid. They're getting rapid insulin. You don't give rapid insulin if dietary tells you the, the tray's on its way, because things can happen. What if the person's bringing the tray has a heart attack or a seizure, right? And you gave that rapid acting insulin to the patient already. What kills a patient faster, hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia? Hypoglycemia. You are not going to give a rapid active insulin to a patient unless you can physically see that food right there next to the patient and you watch them. You tell them to eat and you make sure that they eat because you don't want that patient to bottom out on you. Okay. Um, something else that you guys need to keep in mind when we're talking about what is it? Rapid acting. Remember, um, the onset is, which is five to 10 minutes. That's why, you know, we're not playing with this. We want to see the food there because within five to 10 minutes, their blood sugar is going to start to go down. We need to make sure they ate. Remember the peak time is about two to four hours. So that same patient that you are watching eat because you gave them the insulin, you didn't want them to bottom out. You're going to be checking them much more closely within two to four hours, actually starting in two hours because two to four hours after administration, that's your window for them to have a hypoglycemic reaction for them to bottom out on you, okay? That's why that's the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, ensure the client's wearing a medic alert bracelet. That's important. The patient's diabetic, you're gonna teach them to wear a medic alert bracelet, but that's not our priority right now. Not with us about to give a rapid acting insulin. They're in the hospital, we know who they are. So even though it's important that we teach them that, that's not our priority at the moment. Choice two, administer the dose according to regular insulin sliding scale. Why would you do that? You're giving a rapid. Why are you going by a regular insulin sliding scale? Does that make any sense? And guys, this is how they trick you. You have to read closely and carefully because I know many of you just skipped over that one word that said regular insulin and it didn't click to you that you were giving rapid 
insulin, right? So take your time. Don't take forever, but take your time reading so you don't make mistakes. Choice three, assess the client for um, this long phrase. I just call it HHNKS because that's what I teach it. I'm not saying that whole a phrase again. But anyway, with this, let me tell you why this is wrong. Your type ones tend to get DKA, that's the diabetic um, ketoacidosis, and your type twos tend to get um, HHNKS, which are which is your hyperglycemic, hyperosmolic, non-ketonic um, syndrome. All right. So in this question, if you take a look, it tells us that our patients are type one. So why would we be concerned about HHNKS when we know that type ones get DKA and type two are the one who ends up getting the H HHNKS? So guys, the correct answer is number four. Make sure that food is right there and we make sure the patient eats because we want to keep our license. Next question. Which assessment data indicates the client with type 1 diabetes is adhering to the medical treatment of, excuse me, I'm going to start over again. I can't speak. Which assessment data best indicates the client with type 1 diabetes is adhering to the medical treatment regimen? One, the client's fasting blood glucose is 100. Two, the client's urine specimen has no ketones. Three, the client's glycosylate hemoglobin is 5.8. Or four, the client's glucometer reading is 120. And guys, the correct answer is three. The client's gly glycosylated hemoglobin is 5.8. That word adhere, another word for it is compliance. How do we know that the patient's really doing what we told them to do? And the answer is the hemoglobin A1C. The hemoglobin A1C, guys, gives us a picture of how their blood sugar has been looking for the past 90 days, for the past three months. And the reason that tells us if the patient's been complied or not, if they come in a doctor office and we just do a simple finger stick, well, you know what? They could have just had a salad last night, didn't eat anything this morning, and they tricked us with that glucometer check. But the hemoglobin A1C, you can't trick us because we know what the past 90 days have looked like. And we know if you've been adhering to your diet, you've been adhering to your exercise, you've been adhering to your medications or not. All right. So that's why that's the correct answer. Choices one, two, and four, that does not show us if the patient's been compliant or not. All right, next question. The nurse is discussing a storage of insulin vials with the client. Which statement indicates the client understands the teaching concerning storage of insulin? One, I'll keep my unopened vial of insulin in the refrigerator. Two, I can keep my insulin in the trunk of my car so I'll have it at all times. Three, if it's all, if excuse me, it is all right to put my unopened insulin vials in the freezer or four, if I pre-fill my insulin syringes, I must use them within one to two days. And guys, the correct answer is one. I'll keep my unopened vials of insulin in the, in the refrigerator. And that's good because when you keep in the refrigerator, that cool environment keeps that medication's potency, okay? Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Um, two, I can keep my insulin in the trunk of my car. And three, it's all right to put my unopened insulin vials in the freezer. Extreme temperatures, guys, such as freezing or extreme temperatures, such as you having it in the trunk of your car and it getting hot. What it does is it decreases the effectiveness of the drug. It breaks down and it's just not as effective. You want to keep that medication in the fridge. And four, if I pre-fill my insulin syringes, I must use them within one to two days. No, if you um, pre-fill those syringes, you can. You have to use them within one to two weeks, not days. You have one to two weeks to use them. So guys, the correct answer is number one. By the way, um, once you open that vial... You know how you have it, you had it stored in the refrigerator, but once you actually open it, you can leave it out in room temperature for about a month. It's, it'll be good for a month. So before you open it, you're going to have it in the refrigerator. You want to keep its potency, right? But once you open it, you can have it out in room temperature for up to a month. Next question. Which statement best describes the pharmacodynamics of insulin? One, insulin causes the pancreas to secrete glucose in the bloodstream. Two, insulin is metabolized by the liver and muscle and excreted in the urine. 
Three, insulin is needed to maintain colloidal osmotic pressure in the bloodstream. Or four, insulin lowers blood glucose by promoting use of glucose in body cells. And guys, the correct answer is four. Insulin lowers blood glucose by promoting use of glucose in body cells. And that's what it does. That's exactly what it does. When you see that question saying pharmacodynamics, that's just a fancy way of saying a mechanism of action. And number four is the exact mechanism of action. It lowers that blood glucose and allows the glucose to be available to the cells that need it, right? It's not doing anything when it's in the bloodstream. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, insulin causes pancreas to secrete glucose into the bloodstream. So you're saying insulin makes the patient's blood uh, sugar go up? No, that's false. Choice two, insulin is metabolized by the liver and muscle and it's excreted in the urine. That is the pharmacokinetics of insulin. Choice three, insulin is needed to maintain colloidal osmotic pressure in the bloodstream. That is wrong. What does that, guys? That osmotic colloidal uh, pressure that keeps that fluid within the vessel. What does that? Albumin which is a type of protein, by the way, but albumin does that. Guys, I have so many more questions to go over with you and I can't believe um, already, well, I passed my time. Um, I'm gonna have to do a part two. So all I've covered was, on this video, all I've covered was basically our type ones. And remember guys, our type ones are insulin dependent. They can't get oral hypoglycemic. You can give an oral hypoglycemic to a type 1 all you want and they will die. They absolutely must get an exogenous, that means the outside, an exogenous source of insulin. You cannot give an oral hypoglycemic to a type 1 diabetic. And I've only had time to go over the type 1 diabetics, which means we did all the insulin. So guys, watch out for part 2. In part 2, I'll go over the oral hypoglycemics because remember... Those patients who are type 2 diabetics, depending on their condition, um, they may get oral hypoglycemics, they may get insulin, they may get both, they may get one. So guys, watch out for part 2 where I cover the type 2 diabetics and I will definitely be going over different oral hypoglycemics. Thank you for watching my video and you'll see me next time.